uh, from a leadership perspective, integrating with my team, understanding how they think, understanding their culture, understanding what makes them tick and what's motivating them. So I can make that connection, make them loyal to me and, and, and allow me to stretch them if that was their interest um, in terms of their abilities to be at sell or lead teams, if that was their interest to grow as a leader. Um, so that was, I'd say that that second step is really focusing on uh, integrating them and creating that loyalty uh, and trust that I was there to help them grow and, and, and had a genuine interest in, in helping them, them grow their career and, and uh, had a lot to teach them. Hey, what's up, everybody? That was Jamie Zubia, this episode's guest on the podcast. Thanks for turn, tuning in. This podcast is geared toward independent personal training studio owners. And it's about fitness business, it's about the business of fitness and how you can be more successful. And how can you be successful without clients? Profit Marketing Solutions will get you clients. And if you need a website where clients can schedule their first assess, uh, assessment or first session, trial workout, um, buy your offer through the website, drive revenue and leads through the website. If your current one can't do that, try Offering Tree. All of that is included for as little as $5 a month. And then if you're looking for a product to take care of your client's soft tissue issues, find uh, go to one that hits spots that other products on the market just don't hit and it incorporates a cold therapy so you get anti-inflammatory effects as well check out cryo releaser go to trainer gym and click on exclusive offers by sponsors and get discounts that you can't get anywhere else but through this show trainergym.net exclusive offers from sponsors and start saving money while you make more money coming up on this episode like i said i have jamie coming up next i have jamie and the most important thing that you can build for your success is a team that works together and contributes to everyone on the team's success. And Jamie has done that in over a half dozen countries. So he knows the fundamental principles that you need to adhere to to build a team that is driving towards success. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Jamie Zubia. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Masters in Fitness Business podcast, where you get to stand on the shoulders of giants. And today I have with me Jamie Zumbia, who is with uh, currently with ABC Financial. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But the reason I wanted to have Jamie on the show is that he has worked in the fitness industry since he's gotten out of high school, going on three decades, if I can uh, kind of give away his age a little bit. But, um, <laughs> and, but he's been in the fitness industry for you know 27 years. And he's worked in one, two, three, four, five, six different countries, six different markets around the world. Um, and so we were talking a little bit about that before he came in and, and talking about how that ch can change your perspective and common themes that work all around the world and things that maybe are unique to a certain market. But uh, Jamie, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking time out. Thanks, Jim. And uh, Jamie is a hardworking guy. Um, every time I'm around him, he he never stops, and he works for the right company because he is always practicing ABC. Always be closing. He's always on the <laughs> job. He's always selling. Uh, and so we literally have him in his car on the road as he's out uh, visiting his clients out on the road. So uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Sure thing. Um, what I wanted to, uh, one of the things we talked about briefly before we started recording was, um, since you've worked all around the world, um, let's talk about that. Are there common themes in fitness or do, does it look different depending on where you are in the world? Um, it definitely looks different everywhere. And, and how I gauge that is more so how, how many years behind are they from what we're doing in the U.S.? So the U.S. is kind of set as a marker on where everyone wants to be and how they're operating. And, um, you know, definitely starting my career, as you already put out how many years, you can tell there I started in an analog environment. <laughs> and then, of course, now in a digital environment, the speed of how different markets are, are um, 
catching up to or trying to get current from what's going on in the States, that gap is shortened quite a bit, as you can imagine. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, man, I think that's the common theme is, is how fast, um, can they do, uh, what is going on in the States and duplicate those, uh, you know, utilize those same tools, be it functional training, um, small group training, CrossFit boutique type of thing, which is kind of the, the, the norm now of the new thing. Um, how fast can these other countries kind of create that? in their market and will those same uh, uh, um, uh, new concepts pop up in the same way and have the same popularity. But typically that's kind of what I've seen as a common theme is um, trying to emulate what's going on in the, in, in the U S. Gotcha. And um, so you're saying because of the digital age that that learning curve is shortened quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And, and, and um, you know, my, my best example of that, my, my last assignment abroad was in Madrid, Spain, and I had actually seen VR classes there before I'd seen them in the U.S. Oh, so, wow. And, and again, that might be because I just didn't have that visibility in the U.S. At the t- before I went to Madrid, I was in Puerto Rico, which, um, you know, they weren't, they hadn't hit Puerto Rico, but um, it was uh, from some of the bigger chains out in, in Spain and in Europe, uh they had already implemented VR classes out there and it was a big selling point for them to to, you know, how many classes per week they had on their, on their schedule. And was it successful for them? No. um, You know, from my learnings in three Latin markets, uh, Latinos in general, they need that human, that passion, that energy. Um, Many of them need that appearance also to motivate them. Uh, So a a human body in front of them is really what's going to get them to that, group fitness class and, and get them engaged and, and getting working hard and getting the workout they want. Uh, interesting, interesting insight. Since you mentioned a couple of the sites that uh, you've, the countries you've worked with, let's go through the list. So, um, cause we were talking a little bit about it before you recorded. So uh, did you start here in the U S yeah, I started in um, from a town called Oxnard, California, about 60 miles North of LA coastal town. I started in a small, uh, well, a medium size uh, racket club there that was slowly converting the racquetball courts into fitness space and um, just worked there part time before I went, went to college in the morning. And then um, from there, got hooked and, and uh, met up with this guy who was a guru trainer. And we did a um, went, came together in a partnership with uh, two other partners. And we did a small group training studio back in what was this, 95? So, and that wasn't the thing back then. We had right. like 2,000 square foot space. And um, so that was my second venture. Then uh, a buddy of mine was working for 24-hour fitness. They had just became 24-hour fitness family fitness centers in Southern California, merged with or uh, was bought out by 24-hour Nautilus Master Ops Group. And um, so I went to work for them and had a 10-year uh, run with 24-hour fitness, very successful. I left as a district manager in the Vegas market. And then... Um, uh, from there, I took a sabbatical after my father passed, as uh, he asked me to, you know, go home and spend some time with with mom and make sure she was good with the transition. And it was kind of figuring out that next move. And I really wanted to travel abroad. It was a, a second passion of mine outside of fitness. And the opportunity came across my plate to um, go to Malaysia. And uh, I was reluctant at first because Asia wasn't initially on my uh, top list, priority list. I really wanted to go to, uh, to, uh, to Europe. Um, but I said, hey, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity, I don't want to live in the what if. So let's give this thing a shot. And if it doesn't work out, at least I know that I tried it and did it and <laughs> check that off the bucket list, so to say. Yeah. Um, and, but yeah, I had a successful run there, went with the promise of uh, potentially going to Dubai as they wanted to open up that market. And um, so they decided initially or eventually against Dubai and, and elected to go to Turkey and India. And so they asked me to go help them start up the India market. And so uh, after about almost a year and a half in, in Malaysia, I uh, went out to India, uh, a city called Gurgaon, just about 20 kilometers outside of New Delhi and helped them start up uh, their first club there and do pre-sale and train the sales teams, the personal training teams. Um, so that was a, an amazing experience. Um, and then I, after that, about a year and a half in, decided to come back to the States and take a break from uh, being abroad and uh, was blessed with an opportunity to work for a company called Urban Active at the time that had a, a big footprint in the uh, Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Dayton, and uh, and Kentucky markets. So um, 
I had about a two year run there and, 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 uh, very successful initially was running the Cincinnati and Dayton. I had a district in the Cincinnati and Dayton market. And then they asked me to come out to the Lexington market, which was their home market. And while I was out there, um, my wife got pregnant and uh, we had a baby on the way and I was like itching to still do something abroad. You know, I got used to in India having to uh, barter with my rickshaw driver every single day and um, take a dirt road and use baby wipes to clean my ears from the dust after I got off. And for, for most of us in the States, sounds crazy, but I got addicted to that, that, that chaos, so to say, because mm-hmm. um, it was out of the norm. I got hooked on that adventure. And, and so being back in the States for two years, although I love my country, I was kind of bored with not having that that chaos. So um, mm-hmm. uh, an opportunity came across my plate to go to Mexico City and uh, rejoin, regroup uh, with the NEV New Evolution Ventures Group. So uh, Mark Mastrov and Jim Rowley and some other investors uh, hooked up with A-Rod and launched a brand uh, called A-Rod Energy Fitness in Mexico City. And they also hooked up with Madonna to launch their hard candy fitness brand and uh, asked me to go down and help them grow that market. And uh, so I couldn't refuse. Um, I went down there, ended up spending about four and a half years down in Mexico City, um, and then uh, had an opportunity to, to leave that market and, and go to Puerto Rico and uh, help uh, um, a group run a, a chain of about 20 clubs there. And that was an amazing experience. That was the first time I used ABC Financial. So um, I had a, a really good experience on the client side of being an ABC client which made me a big fan of theirs. And, and, you know, later on, we'll get into that transition working with ABC. But um, while I was in Puerto Rico, um, one of the largest crunch franchise groups uh, called the Harmon Fitness Group, they mainly have a ton of franchises in the LA market, um, hooked, hooked up with some investors and got the rights to launch the crunch brand in Spain. And they linked up with Cristiano Ronaldo, the, you know, famous soccer star and, and his brand called CR7. And uh, they asked me to go kind of help them launch that second club and work with their their local guy there to, to kind of show them the Harmon Fitness way of operating. So I went out to Madrid for about uh, nine months until they opened that second club. And that was my, that's my uh, uh, expat story, so to say. Wow. So that is uh, not only is that sound fun uh, <laughs> I'm, and with some great adventures and I'm sure some great stories, uh, oh, yeah. but also like. Every time you go, and we talked about it a little bit, every time you go to a different country, a different culture, um, you get a different perspective. So then you come back um, and you, you don't look at, you know, it with tunnel vision. You know, you can sure. look at it from all angles to see what might work. So um, that is quite a resume. Uh, I know I'm impressed and a little bit jealous, too, I have to say. But. So when you go, when you were working, going, traveling all around the world, working for these, these companies, because you mentioned some, some big, big brands and some big investors. So, uh, you know, this was, you know, high dollar, um, big budget stuff. So what would you do for them when you went into a new market? I mean, to help them grow the brand in the market. Um, That's a great question. So initially, um, running sales and and operations and fitness, uh, um, ultimately, uh, the goal for me wasn't to um, stay there for long term. So it was to assess the teams that were in place and work with them to build up their leadership skills to make them more effective on the sales side, more effective on the operations side, more effective on the personal training or fitness side of the business. Um, of course, help them increase their year over year numbers in all aspects and um, and, and build strong, uh, uh, high performance teams in each of those markets. That was kind of my main objective. Nice. So that is something that is very usable for my listeners. So walk us through that. Uh, what's the where do you start? Um, like what's the top priority, you know, from you know, a domino standpoint? And then where do you go from there? Um, so, you know, a little bit of an advantage being an American going over there. They're kind of, I want, I want to say starstruck a little bit initially, like, oh, wow, we've got this cool American boss. Um, so, which is great that only, but that's only going to get you so far. Um, or it only was going to, I recognized right away it was only going to get me so far. One thing that I learned really quickly in Malaysia, um, Malaysia being, you know, an ex British colony, they all, for the most part speak you know, fairly good English. 
um, but with a, a, a totally different accents and more along the lines with, with British English. So I, I was very intuitive to the fact that when I spoke in my normal accent, um, they'd squint a lot, turn their head to the side, and I could tell they had a hard time absorbing, you know, my direction. So I slowly adopted their slang, their accent, their way of speaking, because I found it was going to get me to my end result a lot quicker and, mm -hmm. and, and let them know that I was part of them, part of their family. So that, that's kind of like my second objective is really, uh, from a leadership perspective, integrating with my team, understanding how they think, understanding their culture, understanding what makes them tick and what's motivating them so I can make that connection make them loyal to me and, and, and allow me to stretch them if that was their interest um, in terms of their abilities to be at sell or lead teams, if that was their interest to grow as a leader. Um, so that was, I'd say that that second step is really focusing on uh, integrating them and creating that loyalty uh, and trust that I was there to help them grow and, and, and had a genuine interest in, in helping them, them grow their career and, and uh, had a lot to teach them. So, um, uh, so that third thing was actually going in and rolling up my sleeves and showing them that I can do everything that I was asking them to do. So, um, leading by example versus, you know, the, uh, um, you know, do as I do instead of just do as I say. Um, so I realized, you know, I learned that a lot from the culture I grew up in at 24 hour fitness. Um, we, you know, was fortunate to be part of the number one division several years in a row in the Southern California area. And, and that was kind of our thing is as we rolled out change, um, you know, you led that change by your own example and created your own success and then taught others how to do that. So I took those principles with me and, and duplicated that in every country that I went to. So, uh, be it cleaning toilets, be, you know, be it, uh, checking members in at the front desk, dealing with complaints, taking members on tours, signing, you know, selling personal training, selling memberships, um, using their local dialects to greet people and ask for the money. Um, so showing them that I could also do what I was asking them to do and get results doing it, um, created that trust and made them want to learn more. So I'd say in every market that I was in, that was one of my biggest keys to success is, is those three things, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. That's it. And, and I think that's very relatable because most of my listeners are, you know, independent studio owners. And so they have to build a team. Um, but I, I think that's a valuable lesson because you, you said no matter where you went, you try to speak to them in their language. To uh, You tried to fit in with them instead of the other way around. And I think that's really important when you're trying to build a team and also when you're trying to attract potential clients. You have to talk in the language that um, they understand um, so that um, they can hear your message a little bit clearer. Uh, I think and then also lead by example. Um, not be afraid to um, get in there and clean the toilets, clean the bathrooms, do whatever it takes to to make the business go. And they see you doing that. It's it's, it's, a, it's akin to the general who leads the charge into battle, right? Then the exactly. soldiers fight a little bit more um, uh, more ferociously because their leader is leading the charge. So I like that quite a bit. So once you kind of um, learn the vernacular and gain their trust, how do you go about building the team? Um, so uh, just identifying who was scalable and who wasn't. And then, you know, having that convert, that one-off conversation with that individual saying, Hey, I see some, you know, potential in you to, you know, but, you know, fill this role. Is it, you know, have you thought about, you know, advancing to that next level, be it an assistant manager, a manager and whatever, branch be it sales operations or fitness that they were into and then kind of develop a career plan letting them know very um candidly what skills they were lacking and then you know with open arms inviting them to work with me closely if that was what they were interested in and and and, and revisiting their progress towards building the skills that were needed to, to achieve that next level um uh, on a you know semi-monthly or monthly basis and have those candid talks and reviews and and be open to that criticism and coaching and and many of them were you know i found were super thirsty for it um so uh it was it was really nice to be able to push people that really wanted to be pushed in a way that i had not experienced before interesting um because i know i i'm just going to say it so a lot 
independent business owners, and I'm speaking for myself here, um, they are type A. There's a certain type of individual that wants to start their own business or runs their own business. Um, and they tend to be uh, where they ask for um, forgiveness and not permission. And so when they're talking to employees, I'll, I'll just use myself, for example. When I first opened my business, I was like, I'm going to make this go. And everybody I bring on board better be on board. And when I would talk to them, I would uh, tell them where they were lacking. But sometimes it was brutally honest. So my point is, is that I think you you have to do a really good job of doing that in a constructive way when you said you were candid with them about uh, traits that they're lacking in areas where they need to develop. So walk me through <laughs> what that would sound like. It's I think that's a great question and, and, and great to have um, uh, a good perspective on, on your own self and, and where you feel that you may have done well or not done well. So um, uh, yeah, that's a great question. I, one of the things I learned early on in my career in management was just a uh, simple sandwich technique. You give them a compliment, which is the bread. You hit them with the brutal candor that you need to hit them with as tactfully as you can, which is the meat. And then you patch it up with another piece of bread on the other side, which is another compliment. So that's worked for me, even though it's a simple uh, principle that I learned early on in my management training um, that worked for me no matter what level of the business I moved up to in any company that I worked for. So how do you, how do you phrase it in a way that makes them – want it makes them motivate motivates them to want it um well you can't they you i think you're you're in for a bad end result if you try to sell someone on an idea that's not organically in their interest so they have to be interested on their own on 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 going a certain pathway um otherwise i mean it's easy to sell them on it um but if that's not what they truly want, it's going to be a short-lived uh, uh, prophecy, so to say. Gotcha. Um, so it's identifying initially when you're doing interviews and, 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 and um, given that most of my interviews in the last uh, seven years, so to say, were in countries that don't have the same HR laws that we do here in the States. So this, the broadness of questions and the... Uh, in a good way, in my perspective, I can have a real conversation with candidates. You know what I mean? Right. Um, just open and kind of let it flow versus be real self-conscious of the parameters and the questions I can or can't ask. And I understand that the importance of that as well. But um, uh, I learned real quickly that I could be really good at selling an idea of someone wanted to go a certain pathway. But when they got there, it was short lived because it's ultimately what they really didn't want. They just wanted to impress me. And say, you know, uh, yes to me and, and flatter me and telling me what I wanted to hear. So um, I, I, I learned quickly that I had to find people that really wanted to grow organically. It's what they wanted. And then um, I, I would just have that conversation with them, like um, uh, making sure that they knew I was appreciative of everything that they had done thus far, even if it wasn't up to up to par. Um, but then what the expectation ultimately was and 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 where they're really at in comparison to that and some tips uh, that I could give them to help them close that gap and, and shorten that Delta. So, um, but it was in the ball was in their court. Um, and I made myself open for conversation whenever they wanted. They had my cell phone and anyone could contact me no matter what position they were in for that type of feedback, if that's what they wanted. Gotcha. So how do you find those people? That's the million dollar question. Well, I was fortunate, um, except for my experience in India, to walk into an already pre-established business unit. Um, so one of my biggest ways to scale that was, you know, I always find that like-minded people around like-minded people. So I always worked on referrals when I was on the sales side of the business, personally selling memberships and personal training. I, I made my career and did well on sales by really maximizing my referral base. And so in, in creating new employees and new leaders in the business, I always sought out my key people, my key leaders saying, Hey, do you know anyone else? You know, we want to grow this. Who else do you know? Because I know that 
if it's in your circle of influence, they probably have similar characteristics or traits that you do. Gotcha. That makes total sense. Now, the other question is, um, when you would come into an already existing business unit and you knew somebody was like a cancer to the team, how would you determine that? And, and how would you deal with that? Well, um, that's a, actually a really good question because, um, Again, uh, one thing that I learned early on in my management career was to not believe in speculation uh, and, and, and build your own case of facts and, and, and make your own judgment after you've actually given someone the benefit of the doubt, gather facts, and, and then so. So there's always these little political circles that you walk into when you go into an existing business unit from a ma- as a new manager in charge, so to say, and you've got some staff that don't like this other staff and so on and so forth. And they try to jade your perception on them. And so the key there is staying neutral, making your own assessment, you know, taking those um, comments that you hear, uh, putting them in the back of your head as a note, but then doing your own investigation and, 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 and recognizing that as speculation and then forming your own opinion. Um, if you did find, if I did find those cancers, you know, work within, um, uh, uh, I wouldn't just, make my make it a mission to get rid of that person because they're an existing body an existing person that was interested in starting with that company in the first place there had to be somewhere along the line some falling off the path so i wanted to initially see if i could fix that if there was still a genuine interest of them having a career with the company and growing and what was causing the cancer is it that they were promised something from previous manager that was never uh, uh fulfilled um, because typically you, I would find that with cancers is there were scarred by um, unfulfilled promises, either because of their own shortcomings or whomever, and then saying, "Hey, look, you know, if this is what's causing you to be a cancer and being disgruntled um, employee, let's start with a fresh slate and see if you really want this. Here's what I need to see from you, and giving them that benefit of the doubt. And then if I didn't see that they really wanted to make that change, then you know, work within. Uh, my local HR resources to, to find a way out for them. Gotcha. That's an excellent response. Uh, very uh, useful information um, as far as uh, working with the team. Okay. So then you come in and what are some of the systems? I, and, I, and I know it, some systems are universal. Some you have to, you always have to tweak them to uh, based on the market uh, and where you are, but what are some of the key systems that you find to uh, be a success in that market to grow the market and make the uh, clubs more successful? Well, that's a great question. And um, it, it's going to have several responses again, being that I started ultimately in an analog world. And so I learned uh, uh, how to maximize and master manual systems of tracking, especially sales, because that's ultimately a, when I worked for 24 Hour Fitness, which had a big impact in my growth, rapid growth, uh, career wise. Um, we used manual systems to track sales. So, if, um, you know, we signed people up on paper contracts. We asked for referrals and a manual referral sheet for people to fill out. And then we had this production book to track them in. Uh, we had a section for leads, for new members that we enrolled, our appointments for the day, our sales projections. So I, I learned I was I'm very thankful for the experience I had with 24 Hour Fitness because it taught me some very basic but important business skills that I was able to use and teach and scale everywhere I went. So I would say in every every business model we use manual systems both for sales, personal training, a master appointment book, um, uh, up until I would say um, shoot uh, 20 you know I, I was in Mexico up until 2013 14 and we were just transitioning away from using manual systems and to using a, 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 a viable CRM solution for that because it was a bigger business model. So I know that you have a lot of uh, following from trainers that are about to start their own uh, small group training studio, personal training studio. And uh, I, I would rec- highly recommend going 100% digital if you can, um, if it's in the budget. And if it's not in the budget, maybe rework your budget so you can afford to do that. Uh, because it's going to save you a lot of time and keep you organized because manual systems take up a lot of time and you have to be really good and tedious and and, and uh, um, uh, dedicate a lot of time to managing them and staying up to date. Um, there's so much valuable automation in today's day to help operators 
no matter how big or small your 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 business model is to keep you organized on um, your client base, which would be a good club management software, and then a CRM solution to do drip campaigns on those that you know haven't joined. Um, and then you know there's mobile apps. There's just so much technology help mm-hmm. in Tech today's steps. day yeah. uh, to to help you scale whatever your brand or community or business model is all about. So, yeah, and yeah. That, that's great advice. And I agree with you 100%. There's some of our listeners that may not know what CRM is. Could you explain that to them? Um, CRM is, is customer retention manager. Um, so uh, we work with uh, 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 Club OS, gym sales, in touch, um, it, at ABC, those are some of our, our our top vendors that have an open API with our our, our club management software. So that CRM piece, uh, what it does isn't native in our software. So um, our clients are able to utilize those services and have that um, CRM piece. And that CRM piece, basically, what it's going to do for an operator is any prospect that that comes into your uh, club or studio is and is interested. If you collect their personal information name, cell phone, email, which is super important. Um, those CRMs are built around uh, uh, cadence templates on outbound communication. When does, what day do you send that first text message to that uh, person who didn't join or didn't sign up for your program? What should the content be? Then on day what do you send that first email? What should that content be? When should you call them? So they help you stay organized on the cadence of follow-up touch points with that potential client to try to you know maximize your ability to to get have them become a part of your uh, your community, or your studio, or your gym. Um, yeah. So that's ultimately what it's going to do. There's some of them that also do the same thing. If you're running a full-size gym and not so much a personal training studio, um, do the same thing once they've joined do drip campaigns to those existing members to try to sell them on personal training. So it, it really helps you stay organized and up to date on what, when the best, what, when analytics show the best time to re, to have those touch points and what touch point should it be? Should it be a text message, an email, a phone call, et cetera? And what should that content be? Yeah. So that's, that's a great point uh, uh, because I think with the CRMs, you can also use them and you can use some of your operating software, uh, club management software to uh, onboard new clients, to uh, upsell current clients, to current promotions or deals that you're offering. So it's so much, it's such a valuable tool. And I agree with you that um, you should try to automate as many things as you can. But when I was in Chicago at the Perform Better Summit, and we couldn't meet up that weekend, but I got a chance to talk to Frank Nash, and we were talking about, well, Frank was talking about, you know, he may kill me for saying this, but he said how he hates automation, how it's made us lazy, you know, because instead of like picking up the phone and calling somebody, uh, we want to send a text or we want to send an email or we want to, you know, make it automated to where it's a drip campaign. We're on day three, day seven, day 14, whatever they get this email text. But especially with the way Facebook is kind of crushing everybody down with their algorithm changes, it's more important than ever to get in front of people, be it a phone call, be it going uh, door to door, B2B. Um you know, to community events, things like that. And you mentioned it when you were talking about the Latino population, how they they need that person. They need that human connection. So where do you draw the line between automation and making sure you're in front of people and connecting with them as a person? Well, um, that's a great question and a great point. So I guess it's just kind of weighing out based on your model. Uh, on a full service club, you're going to need more of that automation because there's just too many clients and too many moving pieces to stay um, on that human touch strategy. Uh, on a smaller, small group training studio concept, um, you can do that a lot more. So uh, you just kind of have to weigh out where your threshold is, where you can keep um, core to your core values to try to keep that human contact and where it's going to be just too much for you. And that would be a good way to gauge as to when the right time is to have those technology bolt-ons to help you out with that. 
But I, I, I agree 100%. If and when you can have that one-on-one contact, it's definitely going to be your best option. Yeah, I agree. Because the biggest problem that most club owners have is getting people to come through the door. Once they sure. come through the door, your chances of closing them go up dramatically. But Absolutely. getting them in front of you is the hard part. Once you get them in front of you, then that's then you should. If you're good at any kind of sales, if you have any, if your product's any good, if you have any, your sales process is decent, then you should close them at a decent rate. Absolutely. Okay. And that's where referral. And that's where I would say also referrals are still always king. Um, you know, if you're doing a really good job with your existing client base and you're having um, that, uh, uh, interaction as much as possible. And you're creating that experience that you want. It's a lot easier to ask them to help you out and bring a friend or someone they know to come try it out. Uh, and it's so much easier to, to close those sales because you almost don't even have to close it yourself. Your friends, your clients are going to do that for you. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I agree hundred percent. Yeah. It's like, um, Refer. I I think of referrals like going in to buy a car, and your credit application's already been approved. Yeah, absolutely. So all you, you got to do is pick out the car. So if they sent you, if uh, a client sent them in, then they've already been endorsed by that client, which carries so much weight. And basically, all you have to do is sign them up. You shouldn't have to sell them at all. So, absolutely. Yeah. So I agree with that. The referral base. So let's talk about. Um, uh, marketing. Um, because, you know, um, I heard, who was it? I think it was Mike Arch. He, he said, like, if he said, if most of your new clients are referral based, then you're not either your marketing sucks or your sales process sucks, or you're not good as a salesperson because you're not bringing in, you know, cold leads and converting them. Um, Whatever you think about that statement, I thought it was interesting. Uh, what do you find from a marketing standpoint that works to bring in cold leads or even like an internal uh, marketing um, to bring in referrals? Um, an easy internal uh, referral engine, so to say, is having some sort of giveaway. Um, it's always worked. It's an old school strategy, but no matter what business model you're in, given it has to be the right giveaway that makes sense for the, the uh, area of the country that you're operating in, something that's of high interest, and it can't be um, something that's trivial. Um, but some type of giveaway that says, hey, you know, you bring me a name or someone to try the club out, I'm going to give you X. And then if they join, I'm going to give you X to the X, you know, 10, you know, 10 X, mm -hmm. so to say. Um, those things always, always work really well uh, because everyone wants something free and everyone wants to talk about if they're having a good experience everyone wants to tell their friends where they're training at because it's a it's a it's a great topic piece if they're getting results at your club they're getting asked by their co their colleagues at work what is it you're doing and and they're probably eating different so they're all, always getting questions asked so they can become an e easy billboard for you if you're doing the right work and so i don't see that as as being lazy or not knowing how to market externally to create cold leads at all I think it's it's an organic way to 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 grow your business, uh, and, and uh, uh, um, I I call it definitely step one, and 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 you definitely need to, you need to touch on various ways to market your your business model. Um, but step one is if you're if you're just starting out, man, that's the easiest organic way to 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 get leads. Is just give uh, doing a giveaway. Yeah, well, getting referrals via giveaway. Okay. And what about uh, just bringing in cold leads? Um, like digital I mean, marketing? Um, like, like um, are there any particular uh, strategies or tactics that you find on like social media that have been successful in bringing in cold leads that you're able to convert to a trial than a member? I, I would say if you... Um, Utilize an, an external uh, company that's really good at that. I know there's a mm -hmm. couple that cater more towards the boutique space. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, we work with quite a few at ABC Financial that are really good in the big gym space um, that use a lot of the data in our systems to create their, their digital marketing game plan. So um, 
it's it's a definitely a complicated animal to conquer on the digital marketing side. And so if you're not great at it yourself, I, I would out I would highly recommend outsourcing it. Um, it can be um, very easy to do in a sense of no matter what budget size you have, there's someone out there that will help you at least get a decent return on your investment. And that's, yeah. I mean, from a, from a digital standpoint, yeah, that's a, that's an, a great way to create cold leads. But um, as you mentioned earlier about Frank Nash's comments about getting out in the community, you definitely need to stay connected and, and be involved in events that are going on in your community. That's, that's a really great way to create cold leads and, um, and, and have, uh, 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 a, a decent, consistent strategy around that quarterly. Yeah, I think it's important that you sit down and come up with a calendar, like a marketing. Absolutely. Calendar. And, I, and I think that should apply to your marketing tactics as well as like um, content on social media. I think you should have a content calendar. Um, of, you know, we post this on this day, vice versa. You know, you know what I mean. But also yep. a marketing um, calendar. Like for us, we have once a month, we uh, pick one of our clients' businesses and we cater lunch for them. And then um, once we cater lunch, we say, hey, this healthy lunch is brought to you by Catalyst Strength and Functional Nutrition. And um, and we want to offer every employee of this company uh, a week's you know, trial membership. Um, and so that's, that's one thing on our calendar. Uh, we change, um, we change our banner usually once a quarter, um, uh, depending on what offer that, you know, we're, we're going with. And then we also go B2B, you know, where we'll go to, uh, local businesses and we'll, uh, bring in a basket or something and just drop it off and not ask for anything. And we stole this from Frank and Chris Gilbert is actually really good at this, um, and I took a couple of ideas from him. I won't lie. Uh, the show is <laughs> called Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. So I'm not afraid Absolutely. to steal anything that works. But we drop off the basket. We don't say we don't say anything. We just say, hey, um, just wanted to let you know we're in the market. Um, if there is any of your clients that you think will benefit from our services, we appreciate you sending our way and vice versa. Um, and then we leave and then we'll come back in a couple of months. We'll drop off another basket and this time we'll have an offer say, Hey, if you want, um, you know, any of your clients want benefit, we're going to give you guys an exclusive discount. Um, and if we have X amount of clients and, um, we would love to get you in front of those clients. And if you have any kind of offer that you would like to extend, uh, that's exclusive to our clients. We'll do that as well. And it's a great kind of B2B cross promotion that has worked well for us. Um, we have, uh, what do we call it? Our uh, place band partners. So we've partnered with other practitioners that enhance what we do. Uh, we've got PTs, we've got chiros, we've got massage therapists um, that give us exclusive discounts. There's a couple of cryo places that give us exclusive discounts that only are extended to Catalyst members and vice versa. So, uh, like you said, just all of that, and we've had to actually go to those, you know, people and talk to them face to face. So, I think that's really, really important. I think it's a valuable part of marketing that doesn't get utilized. Um, sure. And and I think those of us who lived through the golden age of Facebook, where you would run an offer and get two hundred people, those days are gone, and they're never coming back. But they, but they've made us lazy because um, that's what Frank and I were talking about. And so now we have to kind of roll up our sleeve, so to speak, and, and get back out there and start pounding the pavement. Yeah. Okay. And then the other thing that I want to talk about um, uh, as we're wrapping up, I'm a big fan. I, I know you're new to podcasts. I've been listening to podcasts since the early days of Tim Ferriss and, and all of those guys. And I'm a big Tim Ferriss fan. And he talks about, um, it all comes down to daily habits. And I read another book that said it all comes down to daily habits. And I believe that, um, I don't believe that success, um, is a, it is an accident. It's a, it's a, it's a habit, right? You set yourself up for success. You put yourself in successful situations because will power will fail you. All right. If you get up in the middle of the night at two in the morning and there's ice cream in the freezer, you're going <laughs> to eat it, you know. Um, so set yourself up for success. Don't 
buy, put the ice cream in the house in the first place. And then when your willpower fails, you still set yourself up for uh, success. So I say that and that I believe that daily habits are huge. So I see you and you're in great shape, man. Um, and you're no spring chicken. And I can say that because I'm no spring chicken. <laughs> I, I'm sure I got a few years on you. But and, and I know with your schedule uh, and I know as I get older, it's, it, you know, it, it takes more consistent effort to stay in shape. Um, so you, you work like a maniac, you travel, you're a busy guy, but you're also a smart guy. You obviously take time for your health and fitness, which I think is so, so important. Um, because I think in order to have a good on switch, you got to have a good off switch. If you got a crappy off switch, you're going to have a crappy on switch. Um, so obviously you take time out to take care of yourself. So Take us through some of uh, your daily habits that you find have been key to your success. Wow, that's um, uh, that's a great question, and, and there, your preface to the question is 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 right on. I think um, uh, what's always done well for me, uh, and being that I've been I've been in the fitness industry for so many years and have been able to survive, is my core passion for my own personal fitness. So. I'm, I consider myself, as you said, no spring chicken. Uh, I, I like to look at myself as those old cars from the early 1900s that have the crank on the motor. <laughs> so if I don't, every morning I work out six days a week and it's my first thing I do when I get up. And if I don't do it, I'm just not as effective, don't have the same energy level. And so uh, I'm thankful that I've been able to, from a vanity standpoint, have, you know, maintain some results over the years. But ultimately, it's um, my driver there is to just have the energy level to uh, be productive uh, throughout my day and have good productive conversations, positive conversations, be it good news or bad news. Um, and then I'm also, um, you know, my father of two amazing uh, boys that um, I like to be able to have the energy to to entertain them and to be a good role model for them as well. So I, I didn't want to be one of those dads when I was having kids that would take them to the park and sit on the sidelines with their phone, checking their emails and all that stuff. So I, I knew that it was important for me to stay agile, mobile, injury free and keep myself fit. So, um, you know, I had my first child at 37, my second at 40. And um, I wanted to make sure when I took them to the park, I was jumping all over those play structures with them and giving them those memories and those experiences that that um, and setting that example for them that, you know, uh, Fitness is, is, is going to keep them healthy and be an important part of their life the earlier that they learn it. So uh, at their young age, they're highly interested in, in fitness. Um, my five, year, five and a half year old can go up and down on the monkey bars, you know, one, one round and back. And, and so they're highly interested in building up their strength and eating clean. Um, it's a challenge to get them to do it. But, um, uh, but so those habits, I, I see the benefit and how they help me accomplish what I want professionally. And uh, in my personal life as a father, um, so my my morning workout is one daily habit that, you know, six days a week, I will ne I, I will do everything I can to never sway from that. And you had a good point in terms of the food aspect of it is setting yourself up for uh, for for success by not having those um, bad foods in the house. So I don't put, you know, bring anything bad home and try to stay even though I'm traveling a lot, try to keep my diet simple and clean. It's not easy to do. Um, but I, I found a way, you know, over the years to kind of, you know, uh, manipulate that. So, um, so that, that's been pretty key. Aside from that, it's just, um, you know, uh, staying on task and staying on, having a good schedule for, for, you know, professionally is an important habit, making sure that, you know, everything you need to get done that day and, and being just as committed to completing that. And, um, uh, uh it's funny when I first started, uh, uh, managing, uh, sales, you know, you, uh, we, we, you manage numbers, you know, you got to get so many leads per day, make so many phone calls, book so many appointments. You're going to get so many shows All of those shows. You're going to close so many. So, um, uh, the key was having enough appointments every day. And I used to tell my, my salespeople, I was like, imagine, um, going to the restroom and having to poop and you forgot to wipe how, how idiotic would you feel? Uh, it's a, it's a really crazy <laughs> example, but for somehow it would work. And I said, that, you know, when you leave tonight, if your goal and you need to have 10 appointments for the next day, 
if you leave here with eight, think of it as, as, as if you went to the restroom and you forgot to clean yourself. <laughs> like, why would you forget to just do that simple thing and just not complete that task? So if you trick your mind to feeling sh shameful in your own self on not completing that simple task, then you'll stay committed to that. And so um, that's it's a crazy analogy, and, and, and but it, it seemed to work for me over the years uh, on getting people to kind of, you know, hit those daily, you know, create those daily habits of, of hitting their goals every day. Uh, that's, that's a great answer. And I think that analogy works because it sticks, uh, yeah. so to speak, it sticks in their mind for sure. Uh, that's yeah. a, that's a powerful visual picture for most people. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. It, was, it would definitely, uh, I read that book, uh, what's it called? Um, um, by Steve Woodruff. It's, um, uh, clarity, the power of clarity, uh, clarity sells. And that's what he talks about making, uh, he calls them word darts or word pictures that stick. So that's a good one. Uh, okay. So um, before we close out, I, I want to get to our questions because that's my favorite part of the show. But tell us a little bit about your work for ABC Financial, uh, what you guys do, what makes you guys special, all that good stuff. Sure. So, um, uh, my, that, right now, my current role with ABC Financials, I'm a regional sales manager. My sales territory is uh, the states of Missouri, Illinois, uh, Indiana, Ohio, Puerto Rico, and, and Mexico. So um, I'm just uh, ultimately going out to um, visit clubs that are kind of an ideal fit for what we do and, and that aren't using our services currently and um, understanding how their business model works. And who, based on their current provider and their business model, whether we may be a better a fit for them on how their business objectives are aligned with what we do or, or not aligned. And then just beginning that conversation. So ultimately, that's what I'm doing right now for ABC. And uh, we've got an amazing club management software product. Over my tenure, I've used probably 13 different platforms of all the, the moves that I made over you know all the different countries. And uh, when I was in Puerto Rico, it was the first time I used ABC, and um, I didn't have to do delinquency follow-up, uh, so I didn't have to call past few members, didn't have to have my managers do it, and I was like, oh my gosh, they do this for us? And um, on my percentage of collectible revenue on my dues tap, um, you know, I had the highest level of collectible revenue in that experience, so I looked good on paper um, uh, as far as what percent was left uncollected every month. And so I became a fan quickly, not only of the performance on that and what they did for me, um, but um, also in the, in the customer service. So at the time, um, uh, my laptop, when it would Windows would update, it would uh, mess up the configuration of uh, uh, how the software was supposed to open up in the browser. And I would call ABC and within two minutes, they would remote in and fix it. And I'd never had an experience with a club management software provider like that before. It was very uh, hands-on and, and, and good customer service. So when I decided to make the switch to the vendor side of the business, um, I you know love a ton of different brands of equipment. There's so much out there on the vendor side of the business that ultimately what I believed in the most and what helped me the most in my career was my experience with ABC. So I really uh, had a desire to work for them. But ultimately what we do great is we've got a very um, simple club management software solution. It's more... Um, uh, 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 functional for uh, a larger scale club that has a lot of moving parts. Um, so it's got a great uh, um, uh, point of sale system. It's got a great calendar for PT and small group training. Um, and where we excel highly is our, our, our billing engine that's bolted onto it. So we do a lot to make sure that we do everything we can to collect uh, your money um, because it's important and that's ultimately how we get paid. So our billing engine is is uh, uh, is unlike none. Um, we do it for you know decline payments. There's a, a cadence of reattempts on that card, and, and we don't charge for those. And um, anyways, um, we just do a lot on 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 the billing side and make make it real easy to navigate to the cloud management software, so you can do everything that you need to do within like three or four clicks. Yeah, that's nice uh, because you can ask any business owner. And the most important thing they pay attention to is revenue stream. Sure. <laughs> if that if that gets interrupted, 
you know, then that immediately goes to the top of the list. So oh, absolutely. Uh, no, I, I appreciate that. So then I, I like to wrap up with uh, some of my favorite questions. So in your time in the fitness industry, which is, you know, 27 years in your experience, which is vast, it's, I can easily say you're probably the most experienced guest from a uh, different countries, cultures, business models uh, that we've had on the show. What has been the biggest surprise in the fitness industry that you've had to deal with that you did not see coming? That um, That's an easy question to answer, and it's a great question. Um, when we launched in India, the mall that we went into, we opened a 30,000 square foot club, but the mall that we went into was a co-op between a huge development group in India and the local farmers that own the land in the area. And so unlike, you know, here in the U.S., uh, uh, when you're going go to negotiate a lease on a space, it's typically, you know, one a broker or whomever that you're negotiating with on a particular space. Well, in India, uh, this club that we opened up in a tower, uh, uh, a shopping mall called JMD, I um, can't remember what it was, JMD Square or something like that. Anyways, um, that 30,000 square feet was compiled of nine different units within the within that floor that had nine different owners. So we had nine different rent deals for one club. <laughs> and, the, and the last one that we had to sign, we had to go to this farmer's house and, and, and drink his milk from his cows to <laughs> seal the deal. Wow. So just like straight from the udder? Yeah. That's... We, I mean, yeah, exactly. Oh, that's hilarious. Whatever it takes, right? Right. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's a great story. Okay, and then the other one is um, what has been your most successful failure? And by that, um, I mean, at the time, it seemed like a devastating loss, something that you wouldn't be. It was irrecoverable, but you were able to take lessons from it that uh, you use to propel you to greater success down the road. Wow. Um I'd have to say uh, India again. Um, go back to India. Uh, the deal that we signed for rent or with all the accumulative deals, it was going to be very hard for us to make enough money to convince the investors to open the floodgates and allow us the funds for location number two, three, four, which is one of my biggest motivators for wanting to leave the market. Because in order for me to... Um, uh, fruitfully enjoy an equity opportunity in that business in that in that uh that opportunity that i had we had to have at least 10 locations for it to make sense financially for me so that was one of my motivators for wanting to leave well with that being said um ultimately the goal on pre-sale was you know obviously to have a decent member count so when you open there's some sense of energy in the club but also build your dues tap so you can pay your bills from day one so we had a three-month pre-sale which, you know, typically you want a bunch of credit cards on file so you can charge. Well, one of the things we found out going into India was that your average Indian citizen at the time, from what I understood and learned from them, is that if you'd used your credit card uh, over the course of a year and you'd used it for more than what's an equivalent of about 2000 U.S. dollars, you're red flagged from the taxation department. There's a lot of black money in India. So no one wanted to use their credit cards to put on file. And we were a 12-month contract model. So... We had to change our business strategy. Uh, we, we didn't obviously meet the numbers that we wanted to in pre-sale. We were able to get about 700 members enrolled in pre-sale at about a $70 a month price point, which is pretty good as a new, you know, a, a first world gym coming into this market. But what we had to do with every contract was get a level. We had to get a check for the initial payment and then 11 post-dated checks for the succeeding months of the uh, total 12 months contract. So that was uh a failure but we learned real quickly changed gears developed a new strategy that worked but it was very very hard to 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 do that um coming from the states as an individual salesperson one of the hardest types of clients i had closing you know because i lived in you know I, first part of my career was in the greater la area so you had a lot of different migrant populations for me personally closing indian clients was one of the hardest things for me to do i could never crack the code on that and being good at it and so my experience there in India allowed me to become really good at understanding um, how to close how to close the deal with with uh, people of their culture. So when I came back to the states, 
I found that uh, I initially came back from India to the Cincinnati market. And one of the clubs in my district was near a GE plant that had a lot of engineers from India. And so the same thing with my salespeople there, they had a really hard time closing those clients. And so what I did was I held a course on how to close Indian clients and became that, you know, I turned the, my uh, sales team into sharks and wanted to, uh, to go after the Indian market and because they learned how to actually do it and crack the code. So that, that I guess to answer that question, that would be my uh, biggest thing that comes to mind as, as, as answer that question. Great answer. Great. I love that. Just there are no failures, just learning opportunities, right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, that's what uh, my coach tells me when I went into my jujitsu match. You're not going to lose, Jim. You're only going to learn. <laughs> sure. <laughs> But uh, OK. And then my last question um, is, obviously, we talked about your morning routine and the importance of that and habits and, and how that shows not only in your appearance, but in your life and your business, everything. Um, so what do you do? Where do you go for self-development? What were the last three books you read, podcasts you listen to on a, a regular basis or anything, you el anything you, uh, else you do for personal or professional development? Wow. Um, so I mean, recently with my um, uh, uh, new venture into podcasts, I've just tried to stay as um, current as possible with um, all the different vendor partners that, and this is more along, more along the lines of my professional development in my, in my current career, um, educating myself and all of our vendor partners that we work with and have an open API with on everything they do and how the integration works. So whatever doesn't, whatever we can't do natively for a client with our club management software solution, how our vendor partners come into play and, and what that solution looks like and experience looks like um, on the client's end. So I've really spent a lot of time over the last three months um, really understanding how that works, be it the integration from the different mobile apps we integrate with, um, the different marketing companies that we integrate with, the CRM solutions, um, just really, really understanding how all that works and how it allows our clients to scale. Um, but in terms of um, uh, specific books, I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not a, a, a good reader. I'm more that's of a okay. listener. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a lot I've of people. Kind of, in the, yeah, there's a lot of, that's a crowded category. Sure. <laughs> the funny thing is I love to read, but it puts me to sleep after like 10 minutes. I just, it relaxes me so much. So I don't get anywhere. So I'd rather listen. As you know, I'm on the road quite a bit. And so um, I've just kind of made over the last three, three months, so to say, made podcasts more my kind of like my, my thing. So gotcha. OK, gotcha. I'm looking hey, for recommendations, though. Um, I, you know, um, yeah, I can give you a bunch. You know, my favorite podcast just for like entertainment value is Joe Rogan. Uh, I, I You probably listen to Joe Rogan. Have you listened to Joe yeah. Rogan? I haven't listened to him, but I've heard uh, a lot about him. Yeah, uh, that's my favorite just from an in entertainment standpoint. Other than that, it's just like you. I, I listen to industry um, industry and competitor uh, podcasts. Just kind of keep up on things. Keep uh, keep up the speed. Uh, see what's coming, what's out there, um, better ways to implement it, You know, better information, all that good stuff. So um, then yeah, I listen to a lot of uh, Grant Cardone, John Maxwell, Tony Robbins. Yeah. Tony Robbins is really good. Um, but uh, yeah, there's so many podcasts out there that it can be definitely paralysis by analysis when you go to look for them. But um, if you find a good one, uh, stick with it. So and then uh, where in the world can people find you if they want to get in contact with you, if they want to talk, ask you about ABC, get more information, ask you about your experience, all that good stuff. Sure. Um, I'll just throw my cell phone out there. It's 787-232-3696. Uh, the 787 prefix there is a Puerto Rican prefix. It's my souvenir from being out there. Oh, so nice. uh, I, I love that. And then uh, my email, you can always hit me up. Jamie, J-A-M-I-E dot Zubia, Z-U-B-I-A at abcfinancial.com. 
And all of that information will be in the show notes. Just go to trainerjim.net, click on this episode of the podcast, and that information to contact um, Jamie will be in the show notes. Jamie, one last thing. Uh, once we get off the air, I'll email you to get your address because I just got these bad boys. I don't know if you can see them. But it's uh, exclusive nice. uh, to the guests of the show. So um, awesome. I'm going to send you one out. Um, and on the back, it says standing on the shoulders of giants. So people can hop on your show. I'm sure they'll be able to uh, have some great takeaways from this episode. What size shirt do you wear, Jimmy? Uh, large. Large. Okay, got it. All right. Well, then Thank I'll, get you. That, I'll get that out to you. Um, and any parting uh, message you want to give to our listeners? No, just humbled that uh, you invited me to be on this um, show with you. Um, you know, I think you've got a great thing going on for yourself here. And um, appreciate for those that have tuned into this particular episode. Thank you for listening. And um, again, thank you for giving me the platform to uh, just share with you my story, my experiences. And I'm, I hope I was able to provide some insight and, and different perspectives to some of the listeners out there. And, and uh, I hope I was able to help you guys out in some way. Awesome. Well, I think you definitely did. I think you fulfilled that. Uh, there's a lot of great information and I'd like to reserve the right to have you back on the show uh, because there was a lot that uh, I wanted to ask you about because your experience is just so vast, not only in different cultures, but just in business and fitness business specifically uh, that I would definitely like to reserve the right to have you back on the show later. Sure. Anytime, man. Awesome, man. All right. Well, then uh, we'll can, I'll send you an email to get your address and I'll get that uh, shirt mailed out to you. Uh, wear it proudly. If you would, I'd ask that you post a picture of it. I would love that. Um, and then other than that, man, have a great weekend and safe travels. All right. Thanks, Jim. All right. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.